there's a cave about 350 kilometers from here. It's in the Swabian Jura, and it's called the Holefels. Um, sorry, this is a picture of the entrance to the cave. And archaeologists have been excavating this cave since the late uh, 1800s, and they've discovered there a number of important artifacts from the Upper Paleolithic era. In June of 2005, they announced a particularly interesting discovery. They had unearthed an unusual object. It was 20 centimeters long, 3 centimeters wide. It was made from highly polished stone, and its intended uh, function was, according to the leader of the dig team, Nicholas Connard, clearly recognizable. So I'm going to put a picture of it up on screen now. I'm going to see if you agree with him. I'll give you a hint. It's supposed to be a human body part. So I'm not going to state the obvious, but artifacts of this sort have been discovered in various sites around the world, dating back tens of thousands of years. This one was estimated to be 28,000 years old. And you may wonder why I'm telling you this. I'm telling you it because it hopefully illustrates the long history that human beings have had with the creation of artifacts for the purposes of sexual stimulation. That history dates back to the Holefels artifact, but also through to the construction of the first mechanical and electronic vibrators in the mid to late 1800s, and through to the dazzling diversity of sex toys that are available on the market today. Now, in January of 2010, we got a glimpse of where the future of this industry may lie. At the Adult Video Network Expo in Las Vegas, Nevada, Douglas Hines, the owner of a company called True Companion, uh, unveiled Roxy, which he billed as the world's first sex robot. Now, sex robots have been a long-standing trope or idea in science fiction, but it now looks as though they're going to become a reality. And indeed, since 2010, a number of other companies have entered into the market and developed prototype models, including most notably Abyss Creations, uh, the makers of something called the Real Doll, who are planning to launch a prototype uh, sex robot in the latter part of this year. So I'm a legal academic and ethicist with an interest in the social, legal, and ethical implications of this technology. And I want to talk to you about some of those implications today. Now, uh, I titled my talk, Symbols and Their Consequences in the Sex Robot Debate. And that's a title that I think probably prompts a number of questions. One of the most obvious questions is, is there actually a debate about this topic in academia? And there is. And when I talk to my colleagues about my interest in this topic, they usually treat me with a mixture of derision and bemusement. But there are some people who research this who take the topic very seriously indeed. And probably the most notable example of that is Kathleen Richardson, who's a senior research fellow at De Montfort University in Leicester in the UK, who in September 2015 launched something called the Campaign Against Sex Robots. This was modeled on a much longer standing campaign against killer robots, which tries to uh, preemptively ban autonomous weapons. And Kathleen Richardson submitted that the social consequences and harm that might arise from the creation of this technology were sufficiently serious to warrant an organized campaign against their development. So what I want to consider in the remainder of the time that I have is whether this kind of organized opposition to this technology is something that we should take seriously or not. And I'll do so by discussing what I take to be the leading kind of objection to the development of this technology, something that I call the symbolic consequences argument. And I'll try and explain what that argument is by way of an example or a story. So I don't know if anyone here has ever seen the Channel 4 TV series, Humans. These are some of the actors from the TV show. This was the only image I could find that was in the public domain. So that's why I'm showing it. And the show depicts a near-human future consisting of social robots. They're ubiquitous. People use them in their homes, at work, as helpers and carers, and also as sexual playthings. The robots in the TV series don't have human-level consciousness or awareness, although the main plotline does revolve around a group of five robots that seem to have achieved that level of, of consciousness and awareness. And in one episode of this show, there's a house party taking place, a group of teenagers, there's a robot at the house party who looks like a female woman, and um, she's serving them drinks and she's cleaning up after them. At one point during the party, a group of young men start hurling abuse at the robot. One of them switches her off, and he tells his friends that he's going to drag her upstairs and have sex with her. At this point, one of the female protagonists in the show intervenes and says, tells them to stop, and says, um, 
would you do that to a real woman? Okay? So at this point, the show creators don't stop and tell us what the logic or um, principles underlying that objection were. Like all good fiction writers, they've learned to show and not tell. But I'm interested in the telling. I'm interested in what the logic of this objection is. Because on the face of it, there's something of a puzzle. The robots in the show lack consciousness and awareness, so they can't be harmed by anything that we do to them. And as an aside, this is an assumption that most people within the sex robot debate assume will be true for the foreseeable future, that robots will lack consciousness and awareness. We may create such robots one day, but it's a long way off. So if we can't harm them, why is it objectionable to do anything to them? And I think the answer to that must lie in the symbolism of the act, or of the robots themselves, what they say about our attitudes to, towards real human women, for example. Or, um, in the, or, and additionally, in the consequences of the act. And this concern for symbols and their consequences is something that is shared by most of the opponents to this technology. And their objection can be phrased as a simple, logical argument. And since I'm an academic, this is the form of expression that I like, so I'll try and share that argument with you now. It has two premises and a conclusion. The first premise focuses on the negative symbolism of sex robots, what they represent, and what the act of having sex with them represents that it represents something ethically problematic about our attitude towards sexual norms or gender equality and things like that. So it's a symbolic claim. The second premise, then, is that if they have this negative symbolism or negative meaning, they will also have negative consequences for society. That's the consequential claim. And then the conclusion that is drawn from this by people like Kathleen Richardson is that this means we should probably do something about it, that the creation of these robots will have negative consequences and we should do something to avoid or prohibit their creation. So this is just an abstract argument, a kind of template that people fill out with specific examples of negative meaning and negative consequences. And just to show you how people do this, I'll give you two examples from the academic literature of uh, negative symbolism and negative consequences. The first comes from Cinziana Gutiu, she's a Canadian lawyer who a few years ago wrote an article called The Roboticization of Consent. And her concern was particularly for the way in which robots represented women. And just another aside here, presumably one day we will create robots, sex robots that represent men or that cater to transgender markets. And in fact, the makers of real dolls say that this is something they want to do. But there's a little point in denying that for the foreseeable future, these robots tend to be marketed at heterosexual men. Okay? So Gutiu was concerned about the way in which they represented women. I'll just give you an example of one of the robots she discussed in her paper. This is a robot called Replie Q2. It's not designed for sexual purposes, but you can see the kind of representation it has. And in her paper, she commented how a lot of these robots are thin, attractive, oriental women with high-pitched voices, feminine movements, and they often wear these kind of provocative clothing. So she thinks this is kind of reinforcing negative stereotypes or norms of beauty. And she also worries then about the symbolism of, of having sex with such an object, insofar as it represents women as these uh, passive, ever-consenting sexual objects or tools. And she then says in her paper that this will have maybe two negative consequences. One is that it'll, it will encourage young men to treat women as sexual objects, or else, alternatively, that it will encourage them to withdraw from society and become more isolated and misanthropic in their views. So that's one example of this combined concern for symbolism and its consequences. Another example comes from the aforementioned Kathleen Richardson. So in her paper on kind of launching the campaign against sex robots, she argued that most of these robots are being created with uh, the model of prostitution or sex work in mind. So that the developers of these robots want to create a, an artificial facsimile of the kind of interaction that a client gets with a sex worker. So she focuses, for example, on the work of David Levy, who wrote a book back in 2007 called Love and Sex with Robots, about the future of romantic relationships with artificial objects. And he explicitly modeled the development of these robots on the kind of relationship between a prostitute and a client. So this is problematic for 
Richardson because that relationship is premised on asymmetries of power, where the client has all the power and treats the uh, sex worker as an object. And so the creation of these robots just uh, symbolizes that style of relationship. And this will again have negative consequences because it will, as she says in this quote, legitimate a dangerous mode of existence where humans can move about in relations with other humans but not recognize them as human subjects in their own right. Okay, so that's two examples of this symbolic consequences argument in the sex robot debate. So is this argument any good? Is this something that we should take seriously? I certainly think that the proponents of these arguments have raised legitimate concerns or fears that you could have about the development of this technology. But I want to close by defending or put forward two propositions that call the argument into doubt. Okay, so the first proposition that I want to defend is that the symbolic meaning of anything, of any representation or practice, is highly contingent. And this has important implications for how we approach the uh, sex robot debate. So some classic examples of this relate to the ways in which hu different human cultures treat uh, the bodies of the dead. So most cultures agree that you have to show respect for the bodies of the dead, but they disagree upon the symbolic act that best demonstrates respect. A famous illustration of this comes from Herodotus's histories, where he contrasts the burial practices of the Greeks and the Calatians. So the story goes that King Darius of Persia once asked the Greeks, what's the appropriate way to show respect for the bodies of the dead? And they said that the appropriate way to show respect was to burn the bodies on a funeral pyre. That's what's being depicted in this scene here. Then he went to the Calatians. He said, how do you show respect to the bodies of the dead? Do you burn them on a funeral pyre? And they said, absolutely not. What you, that would be to treat them like a piece of trash or a piece of rubbish. The way in which to show respect is to eat the bodies of the dead. And the Greeks found this, of course, abhorrent. There's something interesting here in this example. You have agreement on what the symbolic practice should do, but in one culture, a symbolic practice has a negative meaning, and in the other culture, it has a positive meaning, and vice versa. And so you have this cultural or social contingency of the meaning of a practice. And this then has important repercussions for how we approach any argument that focuses on the symbolism of an object or a practice. It means that we can't treat the meaning that we attach to the symbolism as something that is fixed, that's given, that we just have to live with. It's possible for us to change the meaning of a practice, and in certain circumstances, we probably should do that. So to give an example of this, the philosophers Jason Brennan and Peter Jaworski have looked at the meaning that is attached to commodified relationships and practices, and they use an example based on burial practices as well to show the circumstances in which we ought to change the meaning that attaches to a symbolic ritual. And the example they use is of the Foray tribe in Papua New Guinea, who, like the Calatians, used to think that the appropriate way to respect the bodies of the dead was to eat them, until it was discovered that this practice may cause a disease, a prion disease. And so the practice was outlawed. And what used to be a positive symbolic ritual became a negative symbolic ritual. So you have a case here in which something that had a positive meaning changed its meaning because it had a negative consequence. And the same thing can happen in reverse. If we have something that has a negative meaning, but is shown to have positive consequences, then maybe what we ought to do is change the meaning that attaches to the, the ritual or symbolism itself. So that means that in the sex robot debate, consequences become all important. What are the actual consequences going to be of developing this technology? If Richardson and Guti are correct, then maybe we should indeed prohibit or regulate the development of this technology. It has a negative meaning and a negative consequence. If, on the other hand, proponents of the technology like David Levy are correct, it'll have positive consequences, which means maybe we ought to change the negative meaning that attaches to it. But that's where my second proposition comes into play. I think that the consequences of developing this technology are likely to be highly contentious or uncertain. It's going to be very difficult to know for sure whether it has a positive or negative consequence for society as a whole. Now, why do I say this? Well, obviously, we don't have any good information about what its consequences will be. This is a technology that's in its infancy. There's no empirical studies that I'm aware of that have been performed about its consequences 
implications for society. But we do have analogous debates, which give us some hint at what the possibilities will be. And in fact, if we are to follow Richardson and prohibitively campaign, or sorry, preemptively campaign against this technology, then we can only rely on these analogies. And one classic analogy here would be with the debate about the exposure to pornography. Okay, so for the past 30 or 40 years, a debate has been raging about whether exposure to pornography has negative or positive consequences for society. According to one recent survey that I read, there's about 40,000 studies that have been performed on this question. And if you read those studies, you'll find many that show that there is a negative consequence. You'll find many that show that there is no consequence at all. And you'll also find many that show that there's a positive consequence. And most of the researchers in this field lament the poor quality of the evidence that we have, that it can't decisively answer this question. So I think when it comes to the development of sex robots, the same thing is going to be true. We're unlikely to know what the consequences will be. So that leaves us then in a very uncertain position. We're facing into an uncertain future with this technology. And when we face into an uncertain future, we have some options. And I think that the main option would be to fall back on a commitment to some kind of fundamental value. So either we embrace liberty, let's say, and think that people should develop this technology freely. Or we embrace uncertainty and think that people should be allowed to experiment with the technology, but we should monitor it closely at all times. Or else we could be highly precautionary in our approach. If there's any possible risk at all, we should just avoid developing it. Either way, though, I think that focusing on the symbolic meaning and the consequences of that symbolic meaning is not the way to go. Thank you.